My guys, thanks for joining us today. My name is Hal Martin with 10 Capital, and today we're going to talk about your timeline for raising funding. And uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box over there, and we'll get to them as we go through. And this will take about 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll have the rest of the time for your Q&A and what questions you have. So with that, let me go ahead and kick off and talk about, you know, how do you set your timeline for raising funding? Um, and the key here is that it always takes longer than you think it does. And so one of the benchmarks I found in working with very early stage companies, and that's mostly the people that are here today, is that it will take you one year for every $1 million you are raising. And, and that includes everything, preparing, pitching, closing, diligence, et cetera. And there are many steps, and we'll look at those today and talk about what kind of time frame that might be. If you do have a very small raise, 250, and mostly family and friends, it can go faster. But when we're talking about a full raise and we're talking about people we don't yet know and have to build a relationship with, it is uh, going to be a, a process to build that relationship and close that uh, funding. So here's a rough outline of what you should be ready to do and, and put this into your plan as well. And so the first thing you want to do in month one is check your readiness for raising funding. Ideally, you have a product, you have some units sold, there's product validation, market validation, the product works and people will pay for it. You don't have to have a lot, but that really helps to have something there or an MVP that's in the market. Second, you've got a core team behind it, you know, someone building it, somebody selling it. No fair, everybody building it and nobody selling it. Investors look hard at that aspect of it and will let you, uh, you know, go forward based on that or not. And then you might want to check with your attorney if you're going to be raising equity uh, and other things. You want to make sure your business is ready for this. You've had, ideally, you filed any patents that you plan to file, such as provisionals. You've gotten your term sheet put together. If you are going to raise equity, you know what you're going to do in that direction. If you're doing debt, convertible notes or safe notes, then there's a lot less to be done there. But you've got that ready to go also. Next thing you want to do is put your documents together. You need an executive summary, pitch deck, uh, three to five year financial projections, and a due diligence box. And the due diligence box is just the basic documents that investors expect to see. Entity filings, patent filings, projections, income statement, balance sheet. And we, we always re recommend you do this because you'll be sending it out a lot. So we might as well go ahead and put it together and make it look good and make it not a paper chase for the investor. And then if you feel like your team is not strong enough, you want to put together a board of advisors, two, three people that might be able to fill in the gaps, you know, fill out the slide of the team. And so think about the optics on it. If you think you need more strength there, take some time to recruit a couple of board of advisors. Doesn't mean you have to pay them a lot or anything. Uh, but it's a good idea to get them uh, signed up to help you with this. And then next is to build a prospect list of investors. These are potential investors that could fund your deal. And you want to put down name, email, phone number, and something about them and start the process of getting ready to go out, reach out to them to pitch your deal. <laughs> Next thing you want to do is start to prepare this uh, investor list. And I always say you should uh, make, you know, contact, start with 10 investors you already know and, and go out and pitch to them first and then add 10 new investors per month. Set that as your goal. Every month we're going to get 10 new investors and we're going to go back and update or remind the, the ones we have already pitched. Up front, that's not a lot, but as you go forward, that will be a lot. And it's either you know, email is a good way but also phone calls and coffee meetings are also helpful as well. And then you start to set up meetings to go introduce your deal to the investor and you start your monthly updates. Every month you want to come out with a short uh, update on how you're doing and send it to all the investors on the list. Uh, next is we're just now in the, the throes of pitching investors. This is usually month six to nine and you're, you're pitching each investor and you're going through and you know, answering their questions, showing how it's working, giving them updates, showing how you're making progress with it. And if you have any incentives to offer, sometimes you may want to give people extra equity if they're going to come in early. This is, always helps a lot. And the thing to do or realize is that investors, you really have to build a little bit of a relationship with investors before they put in substantial money. Maybe they throw a 25K check without much, but anything beyond that, they're going to want to know more about you. You're going to want to know more about them and think about building a relationship as you go forward. And this helps uh, move the, the process forward as you do that. So after you've you know 
pitch the investors. Next, you want to uh, actually go through and uh, close them. And so you can do a lot of events and meetings and calls online. So do as much as you can there. Uh, sometimes it's with phone calls, uh, sometimes it's with Zoom, and then give them information about your industry, keep them updated about what's going on, demonstrate that this is a great place to invest. The I thing you want to think about when you do a fundraise is you want to tie to hot sectors, you want to get in on the ones, and today blockchain, cybersecurity, health tech, fintech, there's a number of sectors that are very hot, and you want to at some level be re relevant or related to them. That. If you're off in an area where there's absolutely no growth rate going on, it can be hard to get the investor's mind share. So think about positioning your deal relative to a hot sector to show that you're going to get some of the benefit of that growth that's going on there. Once you have these investors educated and so forth, the next thing you want to do is close the investors. And this is where you have to start to go out and have them go through the diligence box, help them make the answer any questions they have. They always have questions about it. And it takes seven touches to close a sale. So it will take seven touches to close an investor. Go ahead and just count on that and set up follow-up meetings, calls, events, and so forth to generate those touches, answer those questions, and keep that ball rolling. You, you've heard about the flywheel of raising of closing sales, so you can use that same flywheel for closing investors. Selling your equity is not that much different than selling your product. It, a lot of the same principles apply, so uh, make sure you're, you're, you're putting that into your planning on how that works. Um, you, like I said before, you really need to have your due diligence box or what they call a data room put together. You may have to update it from time to time, but still that, that is ready to go for anybody that's ready to look at it. And those who are serious you know, investors will go into the diligence phase and ask detailed questions as well. <clears throat> Finally, after you have the investors on board, they say, yes, I want to do it. You have to get the, the, you know, the, the contract signed. Make sure you use tools like DocuSign or HelloSign. Make it easy for the investor to get in the deal as well. Uh, don't, don't make it hard for them. Make sure that it's easy to sign wire the money and be in the deal and answering questions they have along the way. So this is uh, you know, the key process that we have going on. I found that some businesses like recurring revenue businesses really don't need to go raise a big chunk of money at one time, like a million dollars. They can raise a little bit every month and that incrementally uh, helps them improve the business. So you can milestone or structure your raise so that it fits your business and your fundraise. My rule is you, you shouldn't spend more than a year raising funding. You should at some point uh, raise enough to do some of the work, stop the raise, go work on the business, and then come back and do another tranche. So if you have a very large raise, think about breaking that down into stages to give yourself time to work on the business and then find new investors for the next round that comes up. So next is, um, and so, you know, fundraising will take time. And so you want to come out with some systems and tools, uh, mailer campaigns, you need a CRM system for that diligence box, you need uh, a Dropbox or box account or Google Drive. And, and uh, most of the diligence and so forth takes place online. So you just want to have online tools ready to go uh, for the fundraise itself. And if you need to consult your attorney up front, that's fine. <laughs> if you're raising equity, I recommend you have an attorney put the term sheet together when it gets finalized in the terms. If you're working with a, a lead investor who's going to do that, that's great. Uh, they, want to, they often want to share the, the cost with you on that, but that's probably not a bad thing to do to get there and be in it. So at this point, let me go ahead and stop the share and let's see what questions people have about this. And we'll kick into this as well. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and uh, post them in the chat box. And uh, we'll, we'll answer these questions first about the slides. But then after that, we'll answer any questions you have overall. Who, who here is raising funding already? Anybody have a fundraise? Just put that in the chat box. Okay, so if you like, go ahead and unmute. Oh, let's see, here's a question. Do we need to provide references of our market research in the pitch deck? 
I think it's always good to put a reference in there to show people what 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 data you're bringing in uh, that demonstrates you are doing research, you know your numbers, and you're not just uh, pulling it out of um, a magazine. You're actually pulling pulling it out of, of of the appropriate database that shows you've actually done you know deep dive research on this marketplace as well. Cool. So I see you're looking for investors, Martin. What uh, what what kind of investors are you looking for? Have you mapped out what you would what I would call the ideal investor profile? Just like you have an ideal customer profile, so you have an ideal investor profile. Uh, you, depending upon your deal, an angel investor may be the best, or it may be a venture capital, or it may be a family office, maybe somebody that's a lead investor, or maybe someone that's a follow-on investor. So realize there's quite a range of investors out there, and think think about what type of investor you're looking for, what average check size they're writing, and then you can tailor your presentation towards that group. Uh, for example, VCs want very large markets and very high growth rates and so forth. And they can be fairly demanding. And if you have the stats and the numbers for that, then by all means, you can pursue that. If you don't have the numbers for that, you may want to pursue angels or others as well. So Brian says, I've raised 600K, haven't raised since last summer, preparing to raise a final seed or series A. Uh, Brian, uh, sound like you've had a good uh, first round there and you're doing another round. Um, the question we often get when people raise a seed at uh, 600K and now they want to do a uh, series A is do I do a seed plus? Do I do another round at 600 at the same valuation or do I do a series A at uh, the next level up on a valuation? Can I double my valuation with the series A? And I'd say more than half the time, the answer is you're not ready for a series A. You have to go back and do a seed plus because you're, you're, you don't have enough revenue or you don't have enough team or you don't have the right uh, metrics numbers that the investors want. So it's no problem to go do another seed plus at the same uh, valuation you did last time. COVID's changed a lot of the dynamics around these things. It's taking longer. It won't look uh, out of place with investors. It'll look uh, very, very uh, standard. So it just depends on if you really have the numbers that it takes to get your series A. Yeah. Cool. Hey, That's right. it was awesome. It was cold. Are you on Zaheen? Oh, anyway, um, don't know if Zaheen was asking me that question or asking somebody else that question. But anyway, pretty oh, cool, Brian. Tripping, okay. No, I Great. don't. Sorry, I didn't think it was me. Um, it wasn't okay. Me. <laughs> if you want, but if you want to put it on oh, mute okay. and uh, when it's okay, your turn, yeah. love to have you. You ask that question. Anybody else have a question you want to put in the chat box on? fundraising. And then um, if you want, we can move some of these to a dialogue as well. So who has a question that they would like to ask and glad to answer it. We do get questions about uh, fundraise size, valuations, timing, milestones, et cetera. So let us know what that might be. So the question for Zaheen is what should I do or start with if I haven't raised any funding or investment for my company before doing it for the first time? especially when you do not have revenue in the company. So pre-revenue is going to be hard. It's going to be harder. And what you want to do is get as much validation around your business as you can. So you, it's best to have raised some money from your network. And so it's not zero. I say investors, no, no investor wants to be first. That's what the value of family and friends is they will go first. So go and raise 50K from your family and friends and say money's already in. I always say start with a convertible note or a safe note. Don't start with a price round like equity because uh, it, it can be hard to figure out the valuation at the pre-revenue level. There's just not a lot of data there. It'll be easier to do it later. And a safe note and convertible note, we're not setting the valuation. It makes it a lot easier for the investor just to be in the deal and we'll figure out valuation later. Like I say, don't make people climb the valuation wall. You'll spend a tremendous amount of time trying to figure out what that number is. And that's really not the best use of your time at this stage. The best use is to get out to more investors to come in. So let's, let's use convertible notes or safe notes up front and get some validation behind your idea. Show uh, that the product works and people will pay for it. And by that, I mean, you don't have to sell a lot. You have to sell somebody. 
and you and nobody, you don't have to have a lot of people using it, but somebody's got some customer has to say this is going to work and get a validation behind it. So, like I say, mo most people think I need to have huge revenue. I will say at this stage, very few startups have big revenue, but proof points is what you're trying to build out to show the prospective investors. And having your network put money in is a big proof point. I do get people come to me saying, my family wouldn't put money in. How about yours? Well, no, if your family's not putting money in, my family's not putting money in. So make sure we get enough there that we start to show people that this has got some real uh, promise in future as well. <coughs> Any other questions? Can you share more on how to evaluate a pre-seed business? So I think the key with a pre-seed business is that you're looking, of course, at the team. That's what a lot of investors do. They just go look at the team and see what their experience is, what their commitment is to it, what they've done before, and see how strong the team is. I know many investors that that's all they invest on is just the team. It doesn't matter where the product is. If the team is the right one going after the right uh, solution at the right time, uh, then you can play that game. Why, why you? Why now? Why this? If you can answer those questions, you can make a good case for a pre-seed deal in many cases as well. So that's what I would focus on is the team and the timing that goes into it. And the market can sometimes play into it as well. As well. If you're going after a very hot market that now's the right time for it, it's really kicking up and there's good opportunity, you can make a good argument that this is the right one for it is for you to go after and not focus so much on the revenue side of it because we don't have revenue and it's going to come later but why you why this why now would be a good uh, way to uh, frame it uh, and make a compelling case for it the the thing with early stage funding is you want to raise as little as you need to i get many people coming in at the pre-seed level wanting to raise five million dollars and i say well you know your valuation is very low at this stage you're giving up a huge amount of equity uh, you know going through tremendous dilution and you really don't need $5 million. You really need 500K to get the first product out. And as you get more revenue and team and product, your valuation jumps up and you can raise the bigger amounts later. So be thinking minimum raise and minimum viable product and minimum traction I need to get to the next level. And as you talk to investors, you'll start to get a sense of what, what those levels are. It's 50K of revenue. It's a product that can work for 20% of your database. And uh, it's uh, you know just a very, it takes six months to build. When you, in software, the, the rule is it takes six months to build it and six months to sell it. If you can't build it in six months, you're scoping it too broad. If you can't sell it in six months, you, you built the wrong thing. So think hard about minimum viable products and what you have to put out there just to demonstrate that what it looks for. And remember, your MVP is not necessarily your first version product. Oftentimes, people, more than, more than often, not the MVP you put out there is the wrong package, the wrong price, the wrong bundle, the wrong feature, and your first product is, is completely different. So don't get too hung up on the MVP being your base for your final product because in most cases, it is not as well. <coughs> Um, let's go here. All right. What is your opinion of venture deals by Feld and Mendelssohn as a fundraising Bible? Do you have any other books you would highly recommend? I think venture deals is a very good one. I think it's slanted a little bit toward the venture capital world. I think the, the principles they lay out there as far as pitching and following up, I think those are true no matter who you're working with as well. I don't have a lot of books that I would recommend otherwise, but I would recommend going out uh, to uh, you know, venture deals. And there's, there's a few others that might be of interest as well for how to raise funding. Uh, I think uh, Dave Rose had some good books on it uh, and, so, and others, but for the most part, I think you find most of that content in blog posts as well. Next question is how many users would be considered a good amount of traction? Um, <laughs> I think the key, key thing there with users is, the, is not the number of users, but the amount of engagement. What you're looking for is some number of users that are using the, the product uh, extensively. They're daily active users, they're monthly active users. What you'll find with most investors is they're not going to be impressed with large number of downloads. They're going to be impressed with the large number of of um, engagements, people downloaded and they're using it. And that's what you wanna showcase is how many people are using it and how 
active they're using it to show that we have found a, a niche in the market where we're getting strong customer feedback and strong engagement. And over time, we can go after more of those. So raw numbers are less interesting than engaging users is what where I would frame it. What other questions do we guys have out there? <coughs> And if we need to unmute and ask over the uh, air, you can do that as well. If somebody feels more comfortable just talking about it instead of uh, typing it in, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can do this one by one. Um, hi, yeah, I'm just gonna, uh, without typing, I'm just gonna speak it out so that I guess everyone can hear as well. Go ahead, um, Zaheen. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Zaheen. I'm the co-founder of WeKick, just to introduce myself. Um, but. Just uh, just to get an idea as to how many um, how many slides or how much information should one actually put in a pitch deck because um, we don't really want it to be too much uh, you know to lay it out on the investor so that they don't get bored and they finally do speak to you so yeah yeah ten to twelve slides is what most people need you need a problem you need your solution you need your product. I'm amazed at how many slide decks I get where they don't actually tell me what the product is. They just assume I know what that is. Uh, and then you get into things like the team and the market size and the competitive advantage, competition, uh, financial projection slide, uh, and then the fundraise slide, and then the exit slide. And then if you have some really detailed things, uh, you can put them in the appendix. After the questions, you can put a lot more extra data to answer questions. If you have intellectual property, that's worth a slide as well. And so you end up with about 10, 12 slides that, you know, it flows from one slide to the next. Three bullet points each is what you're looking for because you're setting context, you're, you're demonstrating, you know, the val validations you've done so far, and then you're answering any questions that come from it. And uh, it, it needs to have some nice, nice design on it to show, you know, professional look as well. So that's, that's what I put in there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sure. Cool. All Anybody else? Bob's, yeah. Hall is Bob Seibel. Hey, what Bob. What would you say? Hi. What would you say would be like the big three things never to do? Um, so, so in fundraising, there's more than three. If I had to start <laughs> to pick out the, the top three that you don't do is, um, I think number one, don't go out to raise funding without some evidence that you have done your homework. You've, you know, you have a, a validation behind it. Product works and people will pay for it. Um, I, I have had people come in where the, the last three bu businesses they did were sold for nine figures each. These guys can skip, skip that phase because everybody believes they're going to figure it out. But for almost everybody else, you really need to show a real problem that you know you you have now solved and how you're going to solve it. And there's uh, some some defensibility around it. So that's that's step one as well. Uh, you know, step two is you know uh, getting your network to support it or not getting your network to support it is a problem. I hear that a lot. You know, my family's not going to put money in. I'm not going to put money in and nobody, no customer is going to buy it. How about you? I get that a lot. And I think that's, that's a real mistake because every step of the way needs to show validation. And when you can say your family put money in, well, that's validation. When you put money in, that's real validation. And if you are putting money in, you know, take the money, put it in a bank account and call it an investment versus just paying it out of your pocket. So make sure that they know you have skin in the game and make that part of the cap table and just make that a, a formal thing up front. And then uh, third is, uh, I think the biggest one is not following up. That's the biggest mistake I see. People pitch once and they go away and you, know, you, you don't hear from them again. And when I ran Angel Networks, I saw this regularly. People would come and pitch to my room full of investors. 90% would go away and we would never hear from them again. Have no idea what happened. They just disappeared on us. And I have investor members come to me and ask what happened to the guy with the, you know, the thing. And I say, I don't know. I never heard back from them. Uh, so they never came back. 10% uh, though did come back. They gave us updates, reminders. And on the fourth update out came the checkbooks. It was like clockwork because you have to demonstrate the growth story, not just forecast it, but demonstrate it, which means you are, you are making sales, you are closing, you are hitting milestones, you are making progress. And two, you have to build a little bit of a relationship. And that's not going to be done all in one meeting or one pitch. It's done over about a two, three month period. That's why the follow-up is so important is you have to go back and demonstrate. So follow-up I'd say is the, the big big third one that we see a lot of that most people miss in this uh, area. Thank you, Hall. Cool. Thanks. Anybody else have a question? 
<clears throat> Rebecca asked, will there be a replay? We are recording it. We will make the recording available. So if you missed the slides at the beginning, you'll get that as well. It's, we basically walked through the timeline for raising funding and talked about the different steps and we'll make that available to you guys. As well as the pitch deck. Uh, we'll yeah. also send the pitch deck, cool. Right, so um, uh, another question that I had in mind, how do I build a network of uh, investors or uh, funding, uh, you know, the network on how to, how to build that? How do I exactly go about it? What to find, what to look for, and what, which uh, people or which network should I reach out to? Sure, so there's several ways here. One way is, and first is you always start with your network. Figure out who is an accredited investor if you're raising angel or VC money. Increasingly, we're finding people doing crowdfunding where they don't have to be um, accredited investors. <clears throat> but with assuming they're accredited investors, you go to your network and figure out who is and start building that list and then have them make introductions to others. And then it's a, a referral to a referral to a referral to build out your, your, your network of investors as well. Another technique I've seen that I thought was very effective, if you're working in a space, say blockchain, for example, what you can do is do some pretty deep dive research and diligence on a topic or several topics around the area in which you're working in, and then reach out to investors and say, I've done this research and be glad to share it with you over a coffee. And investors love to be educated about these sectors. They, you know, they, you know, there's 200 sectors out there that you can invest in. And if you're in a sector that you can do some research and, and provide it in a meaningful, cogent way, what's trending, what's going on there, what's, you know, what the insights are, where the, where the opportunities are and so forth. Investors love to be educated. And that's always a, what I call a safe meeting because nobody's asking you to do anything. They're just kind of, you're, they're just coming to learn and they're not being asked to invest or going to diligence or make an intro they're just being asked to uh, learn and they, they love to do that so i'd come up with some research and offer that out and do it one you know do it uh, in person so you get to build a relationship or do it on zoom call so it's one-on-one -on -one, not just an email blast you want to go walk through it answer questions get to know them a little bit so the research technique is a really good one i've seen people use quite a bit and the third one is if you have a uh, access to a venture capital group or an angel uh, group, you can start to research those angel groups and say, hey, I'm going to go do all the angel groups. In Texas, for example, there are 19 angel groups. If you get money from one, you can get money from the others. So you want to go research those guys and start to build a relationship around those, those groups because you're going to go, go back to them at some point with your deal. One of the best tools I techniques I ever heard was an entrepreneur came to me once and said, I'm not raising funding today, but in six months I will be. May I keep you informed of our progress? And over the next six months, and of course I said yes, because I'm curious to see how this is going to work out. Um, and over the course of the next six months, every month I got an update that talked about how they're building it and who the customers were and how it worked. Small, short emails, you know, one or two paragraphs, no more. You're dripping it out. It's easy to read. And then at the end of six months, when he went out to raise funding, he was able to close more quickly because he had done all those touch points. He'd done all the education up front. So if you can get out in front of your fundraise and get some of that education going and, you know, and investors love those sessions because again, they're learning. They're not actually having to do anything. When you go to them and say, do you want to invest? You're, you're, it's, it's a big lift. You, they have to go and do due diligence on it. They have to potentially set valuation. They have to lead the deal. They have to get the legal document. That's a big lift. And so if on the other hand, you're just saying you want to learn about this new area, you'll find a lot more people signing up for it because it's a lot easier. Wonderful. I, I did have another question. I think um, so someone did, I think Robert um, did kind of touch base on that question, but I, I, I'm not too sure. Uh, whether uh, that's exactly what it is, but if if uh, if any nobody has any other question, I'm, I can ask. Sure, go ahead. Perfect. Um, so how do how do how to do a valuation on a pre-revenue or a pre-seed business or or, or startup? Uh, in evaluation. So, well, number one is if I were to do a pre-seed deal, I'd, I'd probably do a convertible note or safe note. So we, we have to put a valuation cap on it, but we don't have to put a specific valuation number on it. And so I would go that direction. If you had to, for some reason, put a valuation number, you start to look for similar deals and try to figure out what, what, what those other valuations are uh, in that space. 
And then I have what I call the rule of four for valuations in the very early stage where you essentially you give yourself $1 million for each of four things in the business, the sales, the team, the product, and the intellectual property. So if I've got, you know, you know, robust sales going, uh, then I give myself a million dollars. If I got a full team, everybody's hired in place working, give myself a million dollars. If I only have half the team hired, we'll give myself 500K, something like that. Intellectual property, if I've got all the patents filed and awarded, give myself a million dollars. If I only have three provisionals, well, let's call that 250. And basically, you just go through and add up all these different uh, elements, uh, sales, team, product, and the... Um, patents and you you can come up with a number uh, around you know three million dollars is my valuation and when the investor pushes back and they always push back they always ask how did you arrive at it you go back and you show them that equation and you're now putting you're now articulating the values that are in the business today so many valuations are the the is the articulating the value that will be in the business tomorrow and investors have a hard time with that you know today's fundraise gets today's valuation tomorrow's fundraise gets tomorrow's valuation and when everybody pushes back you need to have an argument for it you need to have a negotiation for it uh, and if the more you can articulate values that have already been built in the business the stronger your case is and that's the final note is it's a negotiation it's not a not a formula formulas help us get to some numbers but in the end it will be a back and forth for sure <coughs> Um, so yeah, so the, the, in the very early stage, you know, it may be hard to find comps. Uh, so as you go further down the path, it's easier than the upfront, uh, we'll say valuations go up and down with the stock market. Last year, the valuations are very high this year. We'll see valuations come down as the stock market is uh, correcting back down. And so just, just be aware that the investor is going to, uh, put that on the valuation. It will ride with the stock market at some level. Uh, and so you, you have to kind of ride with it as well. Anybody else have a question? <laughs> you mentioned that, and this is Bob Seibel again, you mentioned that the team is very important for pre-seed investors. Um, what what uh, really strong characteristics are you looking for for co-founders um i'm going to be looking for some co-founders uh, uh to join my team uh what should i be looking for in them well the two things you want to think about for team is uh, you need a complete team and that means somebody's building it and somebody's selling it and so if you're building it then your co-founder co needs to be selling it so or vice versa <laughs> no fair we're all building it and nobody's selling it I actually saw a business once where they were all selling it and nobody building it and he ended up with, instead of a software package, he ended up with a, I think a 50,000 cell spreadsheet with all of it in there. And, you know, it's just nuts what they came up with. So, so the idea is you really need to have a complete team. The other thing is you need to start looking at the skills you need to get the MVP out and get the first version going. And what skills do we need to do to go and build and sell that product? And then go and make sure that that's on the team. It's either in the founder, the co-founder, or you start to recruit a board of advisors. And these are informal advisors that are coming in that are going to step in and do a little bit of work for maybe a little bit of equity, maybe a little bit of money. And you, you've got all the, all the jobs to be done or, or filled. And you've got that covered as well. So those are the two approaches I would look at it is see how we get to completeness and then when investors ask, you know, can you, can you do this? You, you can show how the team can uh, uh, co accomplish those things. And that's what you're doing in a pitch is you're showing what you want to do is present a deal that the investor walks away knowing, yep, they can do that. That's going to happen. And when you pitch, you want to pitch in such a way that with or without you, Mr. Investor, this is going to happen anyway. It's fated complete. If you have enough numbers and validation points, you can make that claim. You can show how this is a, you know, we're going to do this. You know, we're on our way. We're going to get there. And uh, investors love that. What they don't like is deals where 
uh, you may or may not make it. And it all depends on me, the investor, because that's, that's just a lot of pressure and a lot of work that they're not signing up for. But if you guys can get there and all on your own steam, Hey, I can just jump on board and be a part of this and contribute where I can and not be under pressure to contribute where I can. So those are some of the dynamics you have to think about from the investor's point of view. Oh, one other follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned equity. How do you determine, you know, what equity do you give out to these, uh, you know, these co-founders? So the valuation really helps. To, yeah, valuation question really answers that as far as, you know, the, the higher the valuation, the, the, the less equity you're giving away. And so for those who are not familiar with it, the way you figure that out is you take your pre-money valuation, what the business has worked before the investment, add the investment onto it, and that gives you the post money valuation. So if my pre-money is $4 million, I'm raising 1 million, my post money is 5 million, you're giving away the investment divided by post money, one divided by five in this case, so that's 20%. So as an entrepreneur, they're pushing the pre-money valuation up and the investors pushing the pre-money value down. That's the negotiation you're having there as well. And you have to show that the market rate is where it is. And you have to show that you are, you, you have the, the, elements that give you the value that you want in that case. <clears throat> I have had entrepreneurs argue, well, I've done the math and I figured out how much I want to own at the end of this process. So I must be worth $5 million. Well, that, that, that doesn't sway the investor is what's in the business and what's in the market. You have to show that this is the going rate and you, they're getting a good deal out of this. And what would be a good deal that they would, uh, that they're looking for? As an investor, uh, something that has a reasonable valuation compared to comparables out there, uh, and that they 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 can see how it, how they can get there. So, as an angel investor, you can do some quick math on it. Angel investors want say five x their money in five years. So, if you bring me a deal that's got a four million dollar valuation and five hundred k of revenue, what I can do is take the four million dollars and multiply it times five. That's twenty. So, in five years, th and this business needs to be. 20, worth $20 million. And if I, to have a $20 million business, I need to have probably uh, four to $5 million of revenue. And so I look, look at our current revenue and say in five years, can I go from four, 500 K to uh, four, $4 million or $5 million? If the answer is yes, well then that's, that's probably a doable thing. If the answer is no, then that's probably too high of a valuation. So they're going to look at your current revenue and revenue growth and they're going to make a projection out five years to see what that valuation is going to be, what revenue you have to have to get that valuation five years from now and see if the math starts to make sense. And so, so you can start to put some numbers on it a little bit to start figuring out is, is this a sanity check, so to speak. So had a question. We were approaching four years in business and total revenue of $1 million in March. What kind of interest in deal flow are you currently seeing in the CPG space with investors who align with investment and the type and stage of companies like ours? <clears throat> so, so $1 million is a good number. I see a lot of VCs coming in at one. Uh, some are now coming in at three, but you'll see $1 million is a really good number. The number that they'll also want to see is gross margin. How much are you above or below 40%? If you're above 40%, then you're going to be really contributing to the growth rate. If you're below 40%, you're, you're not going to be getting, you're going to have to raise money more to get there. And then what, what kind of growth rate do you have? If we're uh, above 50% year over year growth rate, you're in the venture business. If you're below 50%, you're not in the venture category. So those are the other two numbers you look at is gross margin and growth rate to see if you're in the growth stage world or the venture world, I should say. And then they'll, they'll see how that, uh, you know, stacks up. One thing I will say about consumer product goods companies is they, they're, they're, they're much more stable than tech businesses. Once you build them up, they, they don't come crashing down with the next stage of technology. You, you're building brand, you're building a loyal following, and that can, that can give benefits for many, many years. So they're much more stable and long lasting in many cases. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Anybody else want to unmute and ask a question as well? <coughs> cool. So, 
if we have no more questions, we'll go ahead and uh, start to do the wrap up. Anybody have any thoughts? Give us a, a shout real quick. We do this every month. We'll be back next month at the same time. If you're interested in raising funding, we do not only uh, Reg D or credit investor offerings, we now do Reg CF, crowdfunding offerings. And if you have a consumer facing deal, I think uh, that that's really a very viable way to go raise around a capital, 500, a million dollars, $1.5 million. You can raise up to $5 million. Uh, unless you have a really ro a real strong rocket ship, I think you're probably doing better at the early stage of raising 500 to a million. Uh, otherwise, you're spending a tremendous amount of time trying to get to the full five. And like I say, I'm a big believer in tranching it out over a period of time. Uh, as you build more business and more growth, you, you get a better valuation and you can stair step this thing up in a logical fashion, take the pressure off as well. And the beauty of crowdfunding is if you're doing a consumer product goods, you can actually run the campaign on your own website today. And so when somebody comes to invest, they can also buy the product. When somebody comes to buy the product, they can also invest. In crowdfunding, the average investment is around $500. So, and anybody can invest. So you can, if you're not accredited, you can go up to some percent of income, and that's usually around 2,200, 2,500. But the vast majority of people are putting in money at the five to 750k, 750 dollar range. And so think about that as part of your strategy on the consumer side. I do have tech deals going into the crowdfunding world as well. It's just another crowd. It's another way to raise money, and it's another 750, one million dollars for some of the uh, deals that are out there. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up today, guys? Yeah. Uh, so for, for a crowdfunding uh, campaign, what are, what are the metrics that are uh, used or needed to be uh, showcased uh, to, you know, for it to be an appealing investment on a crowdfunding platform or uh, campaign? Well, so growth rates are very helpful in this case. If you have very strong growth rates and the revenue is really kicking up, that helps. I will say they're, they're more about the benefit and the use case on crowdfunding and less about the core KPIs, especially that's why recurring revenue software doesn't do as well on crowdfunding because the real value was in the CAC LTV ratio and the churn ratios and so forth. But when you look at most crowdfunding sites, what you see is you know, improve wellness, uh, increase education, in, you know, you know, decrease student dropout rates. They, 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 they promote the benefits at a high level. They, they come at it from a more emotional level. And when it's $500 on a credit card, you know, that emotion plays a lot better. If you want to start raising 25, 50, 100 K checks, emotion it plays a lot less. And now it's much more about the KPIs. So, and in crowdfunding, you're, you're spending money on the social media ad spend. In the Reg D angel venture world, you're usually not spending so much money on the uh, marketing, but you're spending your time. You're going out meeting people, doing the networking like we talked about in the timeline. So there's some different approaches to it. In crowdfunding, uh, the average met investment is like 10 10. 10% of the fundraise will go into doing social media ad spend, but that, that can help in some cases where in the reg D world, uh, angel VC, you run out of investors that, you know, and now you have to go meet investors you don't know. And that's, that's more work. So there's, there's some trade-offs between the two. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? All right. Well, we will send you the, uh, pitch deck and the video as a follow-up. Thank you guys for coming out today. Great questions, great audience. We'll be back next month with another one. If you want to set up a time to talk with us about your fundraise, feel free to reach out, set up a time. We'll be glad to get on the phone and talk with you as well. Uh, so appreciate it. We'll go ahead and close it now and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one.